All right, so today's gonna be fun because I'm just gonna give you stuff. Yes. Well, like Jesse, how do you feel about this? <laughs> I'm so excited. Are you so excited and you just can't hide it? It's going to be 90 degrees, yeah. But still, it's out. In our hearts, we can remember what it was like that long time ago when it was summer. And it's so harsh. Now it's just joy for six months. Six months of joy. Actually, that's but by huh? two months. Huh? Normally, it's just like January that's slow. Yeah, well, that's good. It's a good problem to have, as they say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for bearing through the summer every year. It gets to the end of summer and everybody wants to quit and everybody gets angry about certain small things start becoming big and uh, we get frustrated and hot and Aaron had a really fun uh, cassette the other day. You know, so that it gets- great. Yeah. That looked gorgeous. It, 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 looked, it looked gorgeous, but- It ended well. Less All's less well that ends well. So yeah, congrats for making it through the summer. That's what this is about. And uh, I, I said it, a couple days or a couple weeks ago, but um, but yeah, thanks again for doing what you do, for hanging in there. Um, I know what it's like, but that doesn't change the fact that uh, I don't do it anymore to the same extent that you do. I still feel very thankful, grateful for the amount of hard work that it is because it is a very difficult job. It is a challenging job. All of you have uh, experienced it to a different extent. Obviously, we all have to some degree families and personal lives that we would like to spend time with and that always, in the summer at least, gets uh, to be a little bit more, we get to be away from them a little bit more than we want to. We don't get to do all the things that we would probably rather do, but, and, and it's a big but, as my Uncle Keith would always say, we get a nice winter that is not nearly so stressful. As we start to get into the winter, one of the, or into the slower season I should say, one of the really big things that I want us to work on is to set up the little things in our organizational processes. Because when you become more organized, when you think through the details of your job, then your work gets a little easier. And easier from the standpoint of, you know, it's not, our work is never easy, but a little less chaotic, a little less uh, rushing around. I think of Travis's Uncle Martin, when I think of somebody who does not rush around, but still gets the job done by being uh, organized and detailed. And I, I remember working with him on a few different occasions. Keith, who taught me how to be organized to the extent that I am, which is still not that great, was always, when I worked with him when I was a young teen, um, he would always have his van set up in such a way so that when he was pulling stuff off, it would go back in in the opposite way when you came back to, to load up and unload and all that sort of thing. And it made the work a lot easier versus doing the whole chaotic, toss everything in and that sort of thing. That was all I had to say about that. But I wanted to talk through some uh, tools that, have, wow, that was, that was impressive some tools and materials that uh, I'm gonna give you today that hopefully will make a few things easier, maybe some things more difficult, but you can you can tell me as we go. First one we're gonna start with here, which I've already handed out, and I'm only gonna hand this out to people who do not have one. Who does not have a deburring tool, otherwise known as a reamer? Anybody does not have a deburring tool? Only Ryan? Yeah. Or, 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 or is Ryan the only one? He has like 10 minutes home. Or is Ryan the only one who is? He always steals by. Shut up. Just a quick. I wasn't here in that class. You guys have it on. As I hand it, as I hand these out, well, you feel free to come get them at the end if you don't have them. So you can store extra blades in the handle on these, and having extra nice sharp blades is really handy because these do not work nearly as well when they're not really sharp. Some people like the ones that you know kind of go in like a cone. I, I never really got into those, and also they they're a little more chaotic in where the shavings go. Whereas with this, you can kind of, you can almost get it all off in one burr if you get good with it, which is nice because the larger the burr, the easier it is to make sure that it comes out versus going in. Um, I've said this a bunch of times, but when you're working with any sort of a deburring tool or a reaming tool, it's most important that you do not get shavings in the pipe. So don't do it like this, do it like this, and then tap it. I've seen a couple of you blow on it. You really don't want to be blowing um, on refrigerant tubing. So, I mean, I know that's a natural response, but that you don't, you know, your mouth has you know, water vapor in it. So, COVID. yeah. Yeah, you might give the air conditioner COVID. <laughs> you might get the Rona. 
Don't give your AC the run. I've seen some of you use it where you just kind of go like that. At the end, when you're just kind of cleaning it up a little bit, that last little bit, you can do kind of quick, but you kind of want to get it in there and then work it around nice and smooth. The goal, again, when you're reaming or deburring, and it's most important when you're making flares, that's the most critical time, is to make the edge even. You don't want to thin it out. If you go too much and you start to taper the edge, does that make sense? Do it too much, you taper the edge. Now that edge thins out and you'll start to get little cracks along the outside. So when you see a flare where there's cracks around the outside, very possibly it was over reamed, over deburred. And if you see one where there's still a little lip of metal that's kind of pushed in on the edge, then that's one that likely wasn't deburred or wasn't deburred enough. Cool? So Ryan gets his, but the rest of you can feel free. All right, well you can grab one at the end. And then we're gonna do the flat top yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So that's, that's those. Um, the next thing that I want to hand out is a really simple one, but I think this is a pretty cool tool. Eric Melly showed me one that was very similar to this. For the stuff we do at least, a quarter inch drive um, ratchet is going to be the size that you use probably most often. We're not generally uh, having really big bolts that we have to break, and having this nice little guy here um, is handy. But then on the other side, you can actually use it with uh, a straight Allen key or with just your regular bits. And so having this in your bag, where you can put it on your magnetic, and then you can get into a really tight spot. I mean, I know some of you have the nice little angled, flexible dealios and all that. Um, and those are nice, but this is gonna get into really tight spots. You could put a regular small, you know, small bit and get into some place really, really small. And the nice thing with magnetic bits is if you're working on, um, you know, like for example, getting the screw out of the back of some drain pans, if you wanna try to pull an evaporator coil without pulling the whole coil out, or I mean, pull a drain pan without pulling the whole coil out, something like this is really handy. Or if you're working on small refrigeration, anything like that. I'm gonna hand these out. Anybody not have the quarter inch 5 16 Malco bits? Anybody not have those? Okay, well, we need to hand out need to hand out a bunch of those. Who wants these? Who wants these? You want one? Three. Need one. All right, so that's the 5 16 5 16 3 8 and the 5 16 quarter Malco bits. Now, when I hand things out like this, the intent is not for you to lose that one and then wait for me to give you another one. That's not that's not the intent. This is the reason why you get a tool fund. So once you lose that one, then you can be like, that was really nice. I'm gonna go buy another one myself with my tool fund money. That's the idea. So, so the intent is to see you with some tools that are better tools, get used to better processes, and then you can be like, oh yeah, now I wanna do this myself. I wanna have the right things to do the job. Now, for those of you, I didn't bring any of these, but especially for these little things like the little wrenches, the Malco bits or whatever, um, a magnetic dish. Have you all seen the magnetic dishes mm -hmm. that you stick on your bulkhead? You can take a lot of those common bits that you use, even, even you can have one with screws or whatever, but having those just mounted there are super nice. Because if you're gonna go do some weird job, you just yank that thing off and they're all just sitting right there, pick out what you need. I found that to be really handy because these things get lost in your bags. That's the problem with taking them, throwing them in a bag is they just, now you can't find them and it's kind of pointless. Bags become like bottomless pits for small little doodads and thingamabobs. So if you are gonna use a bag, maybe use one of your, your flat pockets on the side or a zipper pocket and keep things in there. You know, just some, just some suggestions. But organizing the tools you use uh, is a really big, is a really big deal. Uh, hey Josh, come on in. There's a oh, chair right behind Ryan there. Looking a little sleepy this morning. Uh, we respect that. Next thing, these little. Oh yes. <laughs> uh, he was a what? Yeah. What the air? He was a mess. Here? These little. I don't little... have one, and I don't take want one. Light it. Okay, Grant doesn't have one, and he doesn't want one. Why is that, Grant? It's all my helpers have like five of them. <laughs> okay, all right, fair enough. So this is a this is a lighted mirror. So you pull the little plastic tab out here, and then it is handy to have. Now you can use your cell phone. They're not that great sometimes, and these are the best. Now they do break a lot. So this is another example of a tool that I'm going to give you. But you know they sell these at like Harbor Freight, you know Home Depot, Lowe's, very very common places. So these are going to be more for Installers and install helpers who don't have one. Okay, all right, okay, all right, okay. Inspection mirror, I would suggest, and, and again, like there are two primary uses for inspection mirrors that we use all the time. One is looking at evaporator coils. If you're a service tech, you need to be looking at evaporator coils. Um, again, if you're working on a gas furnace, that gets a little more tricky. That's where you have to go up through the, the limit and, you know, in our market, because we've got 80%, so you can sometimes do that. But 
a lot more tricky. But on fan coils, we can look at the underside of that coil and see if it's dirty. And that's a really big normal inspection point that we want to do on every service call. Every service call. Cool? You agree with that, Sam? Agree with that, Jesse? We concur? Great. Next thing, I've only got three of these. These are the Zebra Short Finder tool. And I like these for a couple reasons. The one reason is, is that these actually um, add some resistance into the circuit. They prevent the circuit from, from damaging components when you're trying to find a short. Not only that, it's got a three amp fuse. Actually, I say it adds resistance. There is one that does that. I'm not sure if this is the one. There's a couple different versions of this. But the main thing I like about this one is it has a three amp resettable fuse. Some of those other brands that with the five amp popper type fuses, um, we've seen them burn up transformers before they trip. And so this one we found to be a little bit more uh, sensitive. And again, we want something that's gonna trip well before anything's gonna get damaged. This is for active service technicians who are going to use it to help find short circuits. This also has alligator clips on it as well as spades. So you can plug it straight into the fuse holder or you can use the alligator clips, which is nice. Can I add on to that, Brian? Yes. Um, there's another tool, uh, it's just like that. It's called the Short Pro tool. It's a 2.5 auto resetting. It has an indicator light on okay. it. So when you plug it into the fuse bank, um, if there's an active short, it illuminates and it stays illuminated so you can um, just go wire by wire. And Maybe I was thinking that that's what this is and maybe this isn't. I think this one has an indicator light on it too. I should probably be a little bit yeah. more prepared. All right, so uh, what's the other one called? Uh, it's called a Short Pro tool. Short Pro, yeah, okay. Because uh, maybe that's the one I was thinking this was. Yeah, it's a 2.5 and the only thing, the only issue I've had with it is when there's a short in the call, so it's not actively shorting until the contactor tries to pull in. Okay. Um, it'll it'll flash and then go blank and it'll actually run the system. It's it's I don't know how it does it, but it, it will. Hmm. So that's the only part of it that gets real tricky because if it if you call for cool or you call for heat and it shorts, if you're not standing right there, you necessarily won't catch it. Okay. Interesting. We need to get one of those and try it. All right. Any other service technicians who maybe sometimes struggle finding low voltage shorts? Anyone? No? Everybody's good? Nobody wants this? All right, Max will take it. All right. The next thing we've got is another tool. I got some of these because you can get them significantly less expensive online than you can at a supply house or at a Home Depot or Lowe's. This is a nice big Unibit. Yeah, what color is it? Yeah, what color? It's, it's yeah, older. I'm curious, what's it's the price of this? I'm going to see the bits of it. No? What are those right online? Uh, they're about uh, 25. So again, <coughs> for people who use Unibits all the time, the cheaper Unibits, they don't last very long. But for a service technician or somebody who's not using them constantly, you're not going to use it that much. So, I liked it. Was it a half inch? Or was I thought it was bigger than It's five eighths. Tell me, Three quarter. Yeah, so Jesse used a, it was like, it was like almost, was that an electrical hole saw specifically, or was it just a? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, and when you're making bigger knockouts in electrical panels, you use a knockout kit. I don't know if any of you have ever used a knockout kit, but that's really the right way to do um, larger, larger holes. But again, we don't normally do that. We're usually making some half inch or uh, three quarter inch holes, um, probably. And I did like your hole. Right. That was that was nice. Um, all right. So who could use it? Who could use an extra unit bit? Anybody? Anybody? No. No. Here we go. You can watch it. Yeah. All right. Here we go. All right, so I'm going to let Bert uh, give his take on these two quarter pressers. So this is the C&D. This is a BlueVac Active Tools quarter presser. One thing that's different about the BlueVac is that it's actually back seating so that when it's uh, all the way, actually, I'm going to do what I just told you not to do. Yeah, so it is back seating. So when you have it completely backed out, there's no flow through it at all. It actually seals closed. Whereas this one is not back seating, so you can back it all the way out and it just opens. So all this one's basically doing is just depressing the core. That's it, where this one actually seals off when it goes up. But the downside to this that some people have mentioned is that it will depress some cores just in the process of going on. And so if you really want to have active control of flow, um, that's not great because if you put it on, it'll just start, it'll just start spraying potentially. Um, but if you have it back seated, then, you know, Jim's argument is, well, the seal engages before it presses the core anyway, so why does it matter? But I've seen it not 
do that. I, I had a conversation. It makes it harder to put on. Yeah. 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 The, the pressure of yeah. binding. Yeah. The, yeah. So Bert said the, the pressure binds it because if so, if it is um, if it is starting to depress, then there's pressure coming out, and that makes it a little trickier. So I think if you don't over tighten it, and if the core is all the way in, then uh, then you probably it probably won't always happen. But that is a challenge with this one. Whereas this one. You can you know you can drive it further out so it's not depressing, but we'll also look at uh, Jessica's version of the Z and D as well. Actually, it's, it's a really tiny one, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I've seen that one before. The only thing I like better about those ones, it's got the bigger thumb screw at the end. Right. And the other C and D one is really small. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have seen that one. It's a really, really tiny thumb screw. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't like to turn. And, and the other concern that I have is how well does it hold if you're using it for a vacuum to depress a um, like a Cormax core? I don't know how well it holds. I think that was the question that there was at some point. The the blue the AccuTools one is really designed specifically for depressing Cormax cores for maximum vacuum speed. That was the reason the reason why they started selling it. But again, we, we find it most useful when you're putting it on the liquid side to prevent refrigerant squirting out. And for that purpose, this doesn't always work the best. But anyway, who wants the C and D and who wants to try the blue back? Anybody? Try All right, Bert's gonna try the C and D. Anybody need, anybody need this other one? I didn't put my mouth on this one. That was a big one. Next thing, and I'm kind of excited about these. These are for people who do maintenance or service calls. What? She really. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe we could learn a lot from Jessica. Okay. That's that's good. All right. So what I like about this one, so it, it's I don't like that it that it is curved like this. But what I do like about the the fact that it's curved is that you can easily put it in your uh, maintenance. All right. Well, maybe we could learn a lot from Jessica. Okay. That's that's good. All right, so what I like about this one, so it, it's, I don't like that it that it is curved like this, but what I do like about the, the fact that it's curved is that you can easily put it in your uh, maintenance bag or bucket. The other thing I like about this is that it has a little like rubber thing on the tip, so it's rounded here. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And again, what, what this is for is for the channels along the side of a drain pan to get in underneath the pan itself or underneath the coil itself. I want you to try them, and again, the main thing I'm wanting here is not to say that this is the bee's knees, but I want you to have some method of getting underneath that coil to clear out the channels underneath the coil in the drain pan, especially if you can see that there's you know, a little rust or whatever down in there. Who wants one of these? Pick one? All right. Anybody who I haven't already told, I've already told you, don't say it, but do, but do you know what this is? Max knows. What is it, Max? It's uh, to mount to a compressor so you can cool it down. The name of this is a cool presser. So you put, put, hook your hose up here, you put it on top of the compressor, and then if you have an overheated compressor, you can cool it down. And when I first saw it, I thought, eh, you know, that's not. But it's a really simple tool. And again, because it's, magnetic. because it's magnetic, just stick it to your bulkhead by your hose. But it has another thing you can do with it, which is handy, which is if you have a tank, a recovery tank, that's getting hot, you can stick it on there as well. Now, I mean, a lot of you are gonna use a bucket of water for that, but um, this is another, another potential use for it. Especially in residential where a hose is right there you can just stick that on your recovery tank cool it down now if you when you have your tank on your scale which you do have your tank on your scale Always. just make sure that your scale is okay with getting wet which most of them are but if you have you know just look at your particular scale and make sure that it's going to be okay getting wet i'll just let you come up and grab these at the end next thing is these and i think some of you already have these this is called the diy vac dv4 i think is what it's called yeah, why back DV4? I mean, these are so simple, but uh, they're handy. You know, handy to have in your little kit. Yeah, these things are way too expensive for what they are. Have you ever priced these out? I'm not going to tell you what they are. All right, next thing. I've never um, pushed these in the past, but I think now is the time. Anybody know what these are? Is that one of the charging? Yeah, this is the super basic one. So all it is, it's a quarter inch female, quarter inch male. 
and it's got a little restrictor in it. And what this is for is when you're charging a unit, really only when it's running. If it's not running and you're doing a standing charge where you're, you're putting liquid in, you put that in mostly the liquid line. Actually, quick note here, when you have a system that's got no refrigerant in it and you're charging the entire thing, so you know compressor, condenser, nothing has any refrigerant in it, you pull a vacuum on it and you're ready to put charge in it, what's the right way to charge that? Everybody hear that? On the liquid side, on the high side of the system. The reason being that when you put liquid in the high side, you're putting it into the condenser and liquid line, which is designed to have liquid. Now when the system goes on, all of that refrigerant has to travel through the metering device and evaporator before it can come back to the compressor. What happens if you do the thing that a lot of us were taught, which is that you take and you open up both the liquid and suction side and you hopefully are weighing it in? You get a flooded start. You're gonna get a flooded start, which means that you're putting a bunch of liquid refrigerant in the suction side, and when that thing kicks on, it's gonna suck that liquid right into the compressor. If you have a really long time between when you're charging it and when you're starting it, like you're just putting a holding charge on it, then probably not as big of a concern. We did it the other day in class on a, on a lab unit because we're in a hurry. But you don't want to take liquid refrigerant, put it in the suction side, even with the system being off, and then kick it right on. That's a recipe for disaster. In the same way that you don't want to take liquid refrigerant and dump it straight in the suction line in any significant quantity because you are going to have a running flooded while, uh, running while flooded, flooded while running, whatever. What's the other word for that? All of a sudden my brain went blank. It's not flooded, slugging. it's slugging. slugging. That isn't so. Flooded is just when you get any liquid in the crankcase. Slugging is when you literally get liquid refrigerant into the compression chamber or head of the compressor, which is exceptionally rare on a refrigerant cooled compressor. Um, but that's the real bad one. That's when you have like almost instantaneous failure on. So the purpose of this is not when you are putting a holding charge in your liquid line. The point of this is when you are charging with liquid while the system is running, which is the bulk of the charging that we do. Charge with liquid in into the suction line. And why do we charge with liquid with most modern refrigerants into the suction line? Because you're not gonna exceed the pressure in the system to get it to go in the liquid. Well, I'm, I'm talking, so when you're running, when the system is running, the reason why we're turning the tank upside down and putting it in liquid is because of blended refrigerants. That's the idea. So when we did R22, we used to, char we used to charge via vapor with R22 quite often. Um, it would go in really slow. The downside is your tank would start to get cold and then sometimes the pressure would drop and you know, then you'd have to flip it over anyway. But, but that's sort of an old school way. When I started in the trade with R22, we would charge in vapor all the time. Whereas now you're supposed to charge in liquid so that you don't get fractionation. You don't get separate uh, constituents going in at different rates because R410A is made up of two different refrigerants. R32 and R125, yes, R125. And it's 50-50 of each. And so if you charge it in vapor, you might get more of one than the other. In fact, you'll generally get more 125 than R32, I think is how that works. But anyway, th there's a reason why that matters, which I, I, I was deciding whether or not I would go into it, but we won't go into it right now. How come? <laughs> yeah, we're not going to go into that right now. But anyway, so that's why we charge. That's why when we're charging our 410A, we're always flipping the tank upside down. Everybody's noticed that, right? Always flipping the tank upside down because our tanks, our charging tanks, don't have a dip tube in them. I had a guy from Australia say, "Why are you turning it upside down? It's got a dip tube." Apparently, tanks in Australia have dip tubes in them. I'm not sure, but. Uh, in the US, we do not have dip tubes. So we flip it upside down. But the challenge is if you take and you open that valve on your manifold or if you're charging with uh, probes and you open it wide open, you're gonna dump liquid straight in the suction line. It's gonna go in really quickly. That's one problem. But then also you could potentially slug the compressor. I would like you to use this. The easiest way to use this is just put it on the tank. So if you're gonna be charging a system, whatever your active charging tank is, just put it on the tank. The only time you're gonna take it off is if you've got a system that's got no refrigerant in it, it's under vacuum, and you don't mind putting liquid because you're gonna put it in the liquid line. You can't put refrigerant in the liquid line, to Ryan's point, when the system's running because obviously the pressure is higher than the pressure of the tank. So if you want refrigerant to go into the system, you've gotta put it into the suction line. But we don't wanna put a bunch of liquid into the suction line, which is why historically we would just kind of meter it in. If you've ever seen a technician do that where they're kind of slowly metering it in, maybe they're watching the sight glass on their gauge, that's what they're doing. But often you're still kind of putting a little too much in too fast, and this just prevents you from doing that. It's also really hard on electronic gauges, manifolds. Yeah, the, the putting the liquid through it. Yeah, yeah, it's bad on the seats. The seals yeah. yeah, yeah. I want all of you to grab one of these if you don't have one. Anybody yeah. who doesn't have one, all, all the back go ahead and grab one. It's not even metal, these are like plastic. Next thing is the fiberglass heat flame blanket um, that you lay down on the on the ground underneath uh, wherever you're working if you're working inside to protect the flooring 
or anything else you're trying to protect. On those cold, cold nights. It's a really, really nice car. Next thing is our electrical probe kit. Wow. And I see, a, and the point of this, the reason why I'm giving this out is to hopefully open your mind to the fact that there are a lot of really nice probe types that you're not currently using, yeah. and uh, especially for service technicians. Uh, for example, if you have to get into a Molex plug and measure, a regular probe is a pain in the butt, but these little needle probes are great. Maybe the intention of these is to stab through insulation. I don't want you using it for that. I've seen people do use them like that because they have a little point on them. I want you using it to get into connectors that are otherwise very hard to get into with a regular uh, probe. The other thing is, and some of you may not know this, is that when you have these kind of like heavily insulated probes where they're insulated further up, this is actually just another type of needle probe, but they're insulated a little further up, those are safer to use in cases where you've got other things that are live around. When you've got a long metal probe, it's more likely that you're gonna short it out. And so always think about the probe that you're choosing and then also your regular old alligator clips are really nice. If you're walking through a circuit, go ahead and put this on common and then you can you know, walk your way through a circuit with just using one probe. So you're not always having to do this. Um, it's also got these little insulated probes here that can kind of grab, uh, grab a conductor or a terminal. Whoa. Which is nice. It's got this little guy here. Now Bert doesn't have to Which grab is another, oh. another reach out and grab. <laughs> Bert, look at this one. Whoa. See that? <laughs> See that? Lots of candy little things, and this is not an expensive kit. This kit, I think, is 30 bucks, something like that. Um, you give it to somebody who actually has ever in their life used the clamp that comes with the meter. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I'm going to break my other ones. Meter. Usually there's a terminal. Yeah. Clamp that comes okay, with terminal. the meter. Yeah. And every meter. You're talking about the alligator clips? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Find somebody who will use it who's actually used. Right. All right, that's what I'm saying. So I this do. is going to be. Yeah, I believe that. That's a match. All right. All right. So we're going to start more with the senior guys here. All right. Here you go. Next thing is who is good <laughs> with keeping proper batteries on your vehicle? Anyone? What, what, what type of battery? Yeah, anyone? Well, oh, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because with this little guy here, this is a really nice temperature clamp. It's one of my favorite tools that I've got. Um, but it's got two downsides. I can't get this package. It's hard to open. It's the red one. Oh, yeah. Oh, who's mommy's strongest boy? <laughs> ah, not me. Two downsides to this tool. One is that the display is really small and in a really awkward location. That's kind of a bummer. The other downside is that the batteries go dead all the time because it uses a tiny little watch battery. So what you do is, this is really simple. I'm gonna show whoever gets this, I'm gonna give you a tip of a lifetime. See, this stays in this really nice pouch, which has a little hook strap here that you can put in the side of your tool bag or whatever. But you take one of those sleeves of the right size batteries and you tuck it in here. Then when your batteries go dead, you've got extras. Whoa. Get out of here. What? Whoa. Looks like you're prepared. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Same thing also with like triple A's, anything like that. Like say you've got a micron gauge. And What's say that? say your name rhymes with Chad Maneer. And say we're in class <laughs> and I'm like, hey, can you grab your micron gauge? And he grabs two of them and neither of them have any triple A's in them. <laughs> they don't do you much good. So in your vacuum kit, keep extras. In your meter bag, keep extras. In your in your bag for your scale or wherever around your scale, keep some extras right there. Yes. And then your life is so much easier. Because one nice thing about Kalos is we don't expect you to buy batteries on your own dime. Oh my gosh. That's a nice thing, you know? If you if you go to Home Depot and the only thing that's on your little order is truck stock for batteries, I'm fine with that. Now, if it's truck stock for batteries and you throw some tools on there, now you get in trouble. See, it's really simple. Or you throw a Red Bull on there, also get in trouble. But if you're just nice. buying batteries for your tools, fine with that. Ace Hardware, great place. Ace is the place for the helpful hardware folks, right? Also batteries. All right, so who wants this? <laughs> Nobody wants this? Get it, Nobody wants it. I love those. <laughs> All right, there you go. 
Here's another thing, and this is also just sort of a demonstration. All right, so this is for heat shrink. And there's a couple, there's a lot of different versions of these. You don't have to use this particular one. The other nice thing about this one is it's flameless. And so the flame is happening in here, and it's got the shield. Downside is, is it's a little on the slow side. So if you're really in a hurry, and obviously it's kind of limited in size too, so you're not going to do giant heat shrink. Um, but if you're just doing a heat shrink butt connector. No, so you just take your butt connector or whatever you're connecting, and you just slide this, you just hook it over, I bet you can cut that thing off. Cut what thing off? The little shield. Yeah, no, the shield just pops right off. Yeah, yeah. you don't need the shield. Uh -oh. but the shield is nice if you're working in a tight area. That's why I have so you this. Know, like if you're working around so other wires, you don't want to pass. So yeah, you would never do that. Right. You'd never work around other wires. So here's the demonstration. I, I wrap this around the other wires. So in terms of <laughs> heat shrink. Butane is the, the bomb. Uh, oh, there's a lot of different types of little butane torches and it really is great because you don't have to have electricity, you don't have to worry about batteries. They make a battery powered, Milwaukee makes a battery powered heat gun now. And it is pretty cool, but it isn't, doesn't have near the heat output of a plugged in version. You know, that's, those are really your three options. You can use a butane torch, you can use a battery powered, or you can use a plug-in. Obviously the plug-in is pretty inconvenient. But one thing that a lot of guys don't understand is that you can refill butane. It's really easy. See, it's got this little guy right here. Goes into the end here. That's how you refill butane. Everybody, everybody get that? All right, so these, guess where they sell them at? Ace. It's the place yeah. for the help. They're a sponsor of the podcast hey. now. I don't know. No, they're not. Which no, they're not, but I would love them to be. It's like my favorite store. Specifically, Ace and Groveland. That's why I don't go yes. Ace. Groveland Ace? Yeah. yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Claremont Ace needs to step up their game. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? All right, so who could use a little heat shrink butane heater? Who's going to make, if I give them to them, who's going to actually start making heat shrink connections? You will? Okay. All right. All right. So here's the next part that I want to demo, that I want to show you. I've, I've got some uh, heat shrink butt connection kits um, that are still crimped. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, it's funny, I said butt. Uh, these are still crimp connections. With your crimpers, there's two spots in your crimpers. There's the crimp that has the indent on it, and that's for uninsulated. And then there's the part that squeezes the whole barrel, and that's for insulated. Does everybody know that? I've used the wrong side for pretty much my entire career, and it works fine, and I'm really not that concerned about it. But uh, when you use the ratcheting one that squeezes the whole thing, it does work pretty darn nice. Now, you got to pay attention to the colors because, you know, it's got a blue, red, and yellow on it, and you've got to make sure to use the right jaw because if you put it on the wrong, listen to this part, when you use the ratcheting crimpers, if you put it on the wrong color, it'll get stuck sometimes, and then you, you have to take the whole thing apart, and it's real, really not fun. Really, really hard. Yeah, I've tried, but then I'm Mommy's Strongest Boy, so if I can't get it, then none of you can, for sure. <laughs> So these are all just butt connections. Now, the reason why you would use, you would use these in place of wire nuts. Uh, whenever you're making a connection between two wires, that's you know they're going the same direction. You're adding onto a wire, whether it's a fan motor wire, thermostat, that sort of thing. Now, in the case of thermostat wires, whenever you're doing a crimp connection, you want to double over the end of the thermostat. So if it's a solid wire, crimp connections do not work well on solid. Yes, Travis? You can, ex on those type, you can extend both of them further, strip it back further, and extend both of them so they don't go all the way through. Yeah, and for that matter, you could even go ahead and make a lineman's first and then pull it over. That would be even better. And as it turns out, I'm working on something about that. And then when you're done, you just heat shrink. Now, I like these either way because they have longer sleeves on them, they cover more distance on the wire. So they, they cover more area. So I like these butt connections either way. These connectors here actually have solder in them. And so when you melt them down, the solder melts and actually makes a soldered connection. The downside is, is that the way they show to use these is just taking two wires and just crossing them. So this doesn't have a crimp to it. And that's the downside, is that while you're heating it, they tend to want to pull apart on you. Um, and I don't really love that. I, how I've used this is if you're going to make an underground thermostat wire connection, you take them, you slide a bunch of these over one side, and then you take your wires, twist them together, twist them together, trim the ends off. So now you've got lineman splices, and then you pull them over, and then you heat shrink all of them. Does that make sense? So when you're making a, uh, a lineman or a Western Union or a NASA splice, whatever you call it, literally it's the simplest thing in the world. You just take your thermostat wires, you, you make them long, cross them over each other, and you just twist, 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 and then snip the ends off nice and, nice and flat so they're not poking out. Pretty simple. But this is just nice because now you don't have to use a soldering iron. 
You just pull them over and then heat it up until the solder melts. So these are these are pretty nice. I'm going to give this one to Ryan because he's most likely to actually use it. Yeah. We've also got a couple little heat shrink kits here for anybody who wants. I'm not really thrilled with these just because of how short the pieces of heat shrink are. It's kind of a bummer. Mm. So uh, we're going to get some more of the big heat shrink, uh, three to one or four to one shrink ratio. So just a quick thing on heat shrink. Not all heat shrinks the same. Most of the cheap heat shrink you buy is two to one, meaning it shrinks to half its size, its original size. Three to one means it shrinks to a third, and four to one means it shrinks to a quarter of its original size. Uh, obviously, shrinking more shrinky is generally better for most applications. And then also, some have an adhesive on the inside and some don't. Obviously, the ones with an adhesive on the inside are nice because they can seal off against moisture. So if you're doing underground connections, that's nice. Downside is, of course, and this is true of pretty much all heat shrink, once you shrunk it down, you ain't getting it off. You're cutting that thing apart at this point. So with some of the non-adhesive heat shrink, you could potentially, I guess, slice it off in some cases, but let's be realistic, that ain't happening. So we like the heat shrink. All right, cool, anything else? Oh yeah, now I've got two, now I've got two major, major prizes here. Anybody here who does not have a large vacuum hose? Anybody here who does not have an oversized vacuum hose currently? The blue hose? Anyone. You don't have one? All right, there you go. You're the winner. Of a, of a wow. blue vac vacuum hose. The final thing is the Navac uh, switch kit is nice because, if I'm not mistaken, let me make sure that I'm not. Does it say here? Well, it's it's say here. Let's it's open it up. It goes up to inch and an eighth. That is true. It goes up to inch and an eighth, where the other brands does not. But whenever you're using any type of expander, so this is technically a tube expander, whenever you're using a tube expander, always turn it small increments as you go. You almost never want to just sit there and expand, and you don't want to also do it really fast. You'll split it or you'll create little weak points. You know, expand it a little bit, turn it, expand it a little bit, turn it, three or four times. Doesn't hurt, right? You're already saving time using it. Um, this one's nice because it's small. Um, I find this one to be probably the nicest from a feel standpoint. Um, that's out there and when you're in the market to get one of these if you ever want to get a tube expander on your own you know like not me buying you one this one is less expensive than one of the other normal brands any installers or install helpers who do not I love that i'll get you pictures too do and you already the... have a tube expander though yes. Every, everybody does everybody does okay well here's what you I've done okay, every installer has one all right so here's what we'll do here's what we'll do aaron you have to give your current one to a helper whose name right. isn't Gavin. So again, the point of this is just a few things that make your job easier. I don't, you know, like, I don't expect you all to be tool nerds. In fact, you're probably better off if you're not, uh, because it is very expensive oh, and time consuming. Uh, but there's a lot of, li especially little small things uh, that do make your jobs a lot easier. Um, I want to mention quickly, th there are some of you who don't have leak detectors or haven't thought about leak detectors or don't maintain your leak detectors or don't know how to. Then that's what, that's a big one that I want to just mention. Um, we've got a whole stack of H10s back here that people just keep stacking up and I think they imagine that if they just keep stacking then yeah, eventually I'll go through and fix them for them. And they are right. And they are right because eventually I'll just get so frustrated that I'll do it. Um, but I would much rather you, in terms of one tool that I really want you to take seriously uh, on your own, it's your leak detector. And the reason is, is because they're so expensive and if I just throw them at you, you don't care about them. I want you to care about them, make sure that they work properly, know how to test them, know how to maintain them, know where to get parts for them, when you need to fix them, sensors, pumps, all that stuff, it'll save a lot of heartache. And having a good working leak detector on your truck is just a necessary part of being a service technician or an installer, frankly. For those of you who are new to the, to the business, obviously I don't expect you to go out and buy one right this second, but I want you to get really good at using a leak detector. So when you're with somebody and they're doing a leak section, I want you to ask if you can do it. Because being good at leak detection, being good at finding leaks, along with, you know, there's really three major super tech super skills. One of them is diagnosing complex refrigerant circuit problems, which, hint, it's almost always airflow. Next is, <laughs> so refrigerant circuit problems are mostly airflow. Next is electrical diagnosis, specifically low voltage electrical diagnosis. And then the third is leak detection. And if you get really good at those three things, in addition to just normal obvious things like cleaning drains well and you know catching dumb stuff, you know, not forgetting to put disconnects back in, not forgetting to put caps back on your drain, stuff like that. You're a pretty good tech, right? I mean, that's really what it takes to be a pretty good tech. Go ahead, Travis. The Testo heated guy with battery powered. <coughs> the extender. 
Yeah, no, I tested the yes. Testo uh, heated diode against, and I can't, can't remember the name of it right now, um, the, the <coughs> number, because it's just a number, against the field piece heated diode and against the um, H10. And they're all, all three of them are, are solid leak detectors. It's about two, three hundred dollars Yeah, very reasonable, yeah. So, um, yeah, and so if you're just getting started, you don't want to spend the money on an H10 Pro uh, or a Stratus like Alex. Hey, Alex, how's that Stratus working for you? It's actually working good now. Yeah, you figured it out? Yeah, the Stratus is infrared, but it's different. It has an actual PPM indicator. So the Stratus and the PGM-IR, the Backtrack PGM-IR, are considered to be the two like nicest leak detectors, portable leak detectors on the market. Uh, but then after that, H10 Pro generally tests out as the most accurate, but also a little on the finicky side. Uh, and then your, you know, whichever you like. I mean, some, some, some people like the TIFF ZX model that's been around for a long time. Uh, just good old heated diodes, which you just got to know your leak detector and you've got to test it regularly. So know your leak detector, test it regularly. That's another thing about that um, little uh, port adapter thingy. You can put that on, put your tank on vapor, and then just crack the valve. Just barely this crack it on your tank. Talking about this? Yeah. Massive. Listen to what I'm telling you. You take this guy, you put it on your tank, tank vapor, so right side up, and then just crack the valve. So now you're creating multiple restrictions. I'm just saying, trying to find an easy way to create a really, really small reference leak. You still think it's too much. Okay, well, what's your preferred way? Use a gauge. Use a test. Huh? Use a, use a gauge or hoses. Okay. Just get a little bubble out it, of it, All of those leaks are very large. Um, so, yeah, that's a good one. So, Jesse makes a good point. Crack your hose put it until you're just barely getting bubbles, then wipe it off, and then leak stick. So that's probably a good, a good way. That's probably the best way. All right, cool. Anything else? Anybody wants to talk about? No? Great. Have a wonderful week. Still going to be warm, but just... It's fall. Just remember, it's fall. Hey. Even if it feels warm, just pretend like it's cold.